Oh, you will stay as well. Well, um, I, I, I've not had the, the, the honor of meeting this gentleman before, and, and so this is a special treat tonight. Um, I thought it was going to fall to someone else and fell to me. Um, Nelson Dennis. And um, Nelson Dennis's book, in fact, uh, right, Dennis? The book is, Mr. Dennis, the book is back there. He's a Puerto Rican author, lawyer. Uh, I did not know this, uh, a former assembly member of the state of New York. Uh, his new book, which, as I say, is back in the back of the room somewhere, War Against All Puerto Ricans, is a dramatic retelling of the U.S. conquest and colonization of Puerto Rico, and particularly of U.S. repression against Pedro Avizu Campos and the Nationalist Party and Independence Movement. His research uh, includes uh, thousands of pages of secret FBI dossiers on over 100,000 Puerto Ricans. He relates that history uh, to the current economic devastation that Wall Street is inflicting on Puerto Rico, still, of course, under U.S. colonial control. And, and somebody was telling me, I believe this is true of the book, it, it, it exposes and talks about the radiation experiments. The radiation experiments, another uh, chapter in the inhumanity of U.S. imperialism, and documents that rather well in the book, a story that is not so well known as it should be. So we're thrilled to have him in L.A. with us. Um, I encourage you to get a copy of his book, but now give a warm welcome to Nelson Dennis. It's an, it's an honor and a privilege to be here. And I want to add a, a memory of my own to something that Lynn just said. It, it made me remember something that Mark Twain said. Uh, he said that one useless, man, one useless man is called a disgrace. Two is a law firm. Three or, <laughs> three or more is the US Congress. <laughs> so on that note, I, 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 I pick up the baton that you left. <laughs> um, I wrote a book called uh, The uh, War Against All Puerto Ricans, and ever since it's been published, it's become a war against one Puerto Rican, me. And I'm very proud to, to, to bring this war here to Los Angeles, um, and hopefully uh, there'll be a, 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 more, a congenial setting here. Um, there's, no, there's nothing more than, I, I think, that uh, I Lynn, that, you, that brings you to life than a good fight. You know, something that, uh, the way I, I come to feel is what's the point of writing a book if you can't piss a few people off and so I hopefully that you know that fits into into the mode and you know the the tremendous life of service that you have given and you truly de in my view have de defined from the highest to the low from Yale Law School to Brooklyn Law School from the court clerk to everywhere what being a lawyer is all about we forget what being what lawyers are meant to be after the revolution hopefully they won't kill the lawyers they'll be Lynn Stewart <laughs> So, um, War Against All Puerto Ricans is, is the story of Albizu, Pedro Albizu Campos and it's the, the history of Puerto Rico. It all came, it came together. For me, it, it started unwittingly when I was eight years old. My father was Cuban and he was very pro-Castro and he was a member of a union, 32BJ. He wasn't a spy. He was just very, he was a, a real patriot and he would have meetings in, a, in our home in Washington Heights and um, it all, though, came apart in 1962 during the Cuban Missile Crisis because they were looking to round up the usual, usual suspects. And my father was apparently they was deemed to be one. The FBI came around 3 in the morning, and they, they took him away, and they deported him without any due process or any, any administrative procedure. And they declared him to be a, a G2 Cuban spy, which is the equivalent of 007 license to kill. But my father, you know, lo que conocen eso, lo que un G2, es algo bien serio. You know, it's like military, you know, top secret espionage. And so I never, I didn't see my father again. And that's something that stayed with me. And I realized with the benefit of long hindsight how that affected my personality, my character, my, my choices. Uh, one of those choices was, pro was probably, I, I t t much to my chagrin, I became a lawyer. And um, it, uh, part of it um, had to do with probably not wanting someone to bust die, m down my door uh, again and, and rip my, my, my life apart. Um, I spent time, uh, when I graduated, I, w I worked in the salt mines in a, in a law firm and I wrote for El Diario La Prensa and I did. I did ser serve in the, the New York State Assembly and then I decided to get a real job and um, I um, spent a long amount of time when I finally saw what's called carpetas. In Puerto Rico, there was a secret police uh, surveillance system that lasted for almost 60 years 
which were the carpetas, uh, police files put together by the FBI on over 100,000 Puerto Ricans, that they were, most of them weren't aware of it. When they were declassified in the year 2000, it totaled 1.8 million pages. I started uh, soliciting some because I wanted to f uh, find out about my family. Some of my family had been nationalists. A few of them knew Al Al Albizu Campos. And I just wanted to corroborate some of these tremendous, uh, uh, amazing stories that I'd been hearing about Puerto Rico. So I foiled uh, some of them and then I kept going and, and, and getting some more. And what I had realized that what I had been hearing, little bits and pieces, little dots of Puerto Rican history, sort of like this pointillist uh, picture that I'd never been able to put together, it suddenly I'd realized that things that were unbelievable and surrealistic were actually happening. And that's when I just finally decided that there was a book that did not exist that I wanted to read, that I wanted children to read, that I, wa that I wanted to leave. And, and that's how I, I decided to, to write this. So, um, I'll, give, I'll walk you through a bit of real quick history, and then, and then we'll, we'll wrap it up, because I, I have a feeling some people, they, you're not leaving that quick, Lynn. There's going to be some questions. Um, no, you're not leaving quick. I think people have a lot of questions for you. Um, um, in 1898, the United States uh, occupied Puerto Rico. And the very next year, a hurricane, San Siriaco, was the most devastating hurricane in that, in that century. And it devastated the island's coffee crop. About $50 million worth was ruined. Thousands of people homeless, thousands of, fa of farms devastated. The United States sent in no relief. Instead, the following year, 1899, they devalued the Puerto Rican currency. These are two roughly equivalent currencies, the dollar and the Puerto Rican peso. But what the United States said by legislative fiat is they declared that every Puerto Rican peso would be worth 60 American cents. It was a straight out devaluation, an impoverishment. It was a uh, Naomi Klein hit. It was a shock on Puerto Rico of 40%. If you imagine in this day and age, what a, if you wake up tomorrow and every one of us is 40% poor, your bank account, your real estate holdings, everything is worth 40, and concomitantly, you owe for, your debts are now 40% higher. That would be a social shutdown. The United States would cease to exist. This building, probably we wouldn't be able to walk into it in a few days because it would be probably a declaration of martial law. Well, this was what, what, how it went in Puerto Rico. You have a hurricane in one year, a currency devaluation in the, the next year, and then the following year, a deep, steeply graduated set of property taxes that had never existed before under the, under the Hollander Act uh, confronted the farmers. All of a sudden, they have no money, they have this hurricane, and now they have these property taxes. Well, what happened very quickly is there, were, there was a default all over the island. People were looking to hang on to their farms any way they could, but there was no usury law restriction, and the only place they could go was to the appropriately called American Colonial Bank. <laughs> so you go to the American Colonial Bank, you take your, you pays your money, you take your chances, and about five or 10 years later, you lose your farm, literally. You bet the farm and you lose it. So within 20 to 30 years, the net result of this was a radical disenfranchisement in the, in the Puerto Rican economy, whereby 80% of the arable land in Puerto Rico was now under US ownership. 80% was owned by national North American banking syndicates. They, can, they, they turned a, a previously self-sustaining, uh, diversified agri agriculture into a one-crop cash cow economy, that of sugar. And the first sugar emp uh, emperor was the first civilian governor of the, of the, from the United States named Charles Herbert Allen. And uh, for me, there was a process of discovery in writing this book. There were some interesting characters. One was Charles Herbert Allen. He went in, he only lasted 17 months because when he handed in his fiscal report to President McKinley, he had taken soil sample studies all around Puerto Rico. He handed in his report, and it was like a business plan on taking over the, America, the, the Puerto Rican uh, agriculture, went up to Wall Street immediately. Within two weeks of handing in his report, he quit the governorship. Within a few weeks, he was a vice president of Morgan Guarantee Trust. Then within the next 10 years, he was first the treasurer, then the president, then the chairman of the board of the American Sugar Refining Company, which today is known as Domino Sugar. This man rolled very, very quickly, and he provided the template because he saw an opportunity. At first, Puerto Rico had been perceived as a geopolitically significant naval coaling station. And, you know, you look at it in the Caribbean in 1898, uh, consistent with the Monroe Doctrine, it, ha it had some value there. But what they didn't realize, what Charles Herbert Allen saw, there's gold in the Endar Hills. There was gold in the soil of Puerto Rico, and they turned it into that. And so, you, and by now, by 1920, 1930, 
all as a slew of carpetbaggers followed Charles Herbert Allen. Allen had an advantage because he got all sorts of, 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 of easements, water rights, a uh, no source bid bid contracts, um, all sorts of advantages, tax abatement deals that were given to his business that weren't replicated to everybody, but there was enough to go around that within, by 1930, they had sugarcane centrales that were basically this 80% ownership was all so concentrated. The four largest centrales, Aguirre, Fajardo, uh, Guanica, and East Puerto Rico sugar, those four owned half of that 80%. So that means 40% of the land in Puerto Rico was owned by four banking syndicates. This was a very quick dis, uh, dis, disempowerment and, uh, and the, the uh, taking away from one generation within 30 years what, it, what had belonged to, to Puerto Ricans. So you had an internal diaspora. People who had, had lived on their, on their land and owned it were now working as farmers, but they couldn't even do that because there weren't enough jobs, so they would move to the, to, to the cities. They tried to get minimum wage legislation in Puerto Rico, uh, but in 1922, under the, 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 uh, the uh, president of Bal Balzac de Puerto Rico, it was deemed that the U.S. Constitution did not apply in Puerto Rico due to the territorial clause. However, in 1970, it was kind of bizarre. In 1917, Puerto Ricans were, de were deemed U.S. citizens so they could fight in World War I. And 18,000 Puerto Ricans were shipped off to World War I. But five years later, that citizenship apparently didn't apply because they applied the territorial clause, which means you don't get the privileges and immunities of the U.S. Constitution, meaning no minimum wage legislation for the sugarcane workers. So the same people that went and fought five years earlier aren't entitled to, to, to minimum wages. Um, that's a, you know, a, a, you know, a, a bizarre uh, a perversion of the Amer American system. Understandably, the, uh, these individuals then try to formulate, well, if you can't have minimum wage le legislation, let's have a union. They formed unions. Um, but they found out that their leadership was basically confabulando. They were in league with the, with the leadership in, in San Juan and selling them out. It was at this point that the, uh, the union movement in Puerto Rico and the workers and all those disenfranchised pe people uh, discovered Pedro Albizu Campos. Pedro Albizu Campos was the first Puerto Rican to go to Harvard and Harvard Law School. Brilliant man, spoke six languages. When he graduated, instead of working for United Fruit or any other corporate sinecure, he went to Puerto Rico and practiced basically poverty law, something that some of us are familiar with in this room. If, they, they could, they, if people couldn't afford to pay him, they'd pay him in kind. They would literally pay him a chicken. The rule that Albizu Campos applied, though, is that he rarely uh, 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 represented anyone that worked for the, for the government. And he never, and he would define it, and he would define it rather loosely, but he said, I will never represent a thief. <laughs> and so um, what, uh, what he accumulated over a period of 10, 15 years was a reputation for honesty and basically being the guy that you could, that really is he, he's representing us. He's a Puerto Rican who, who came back. When these union members found out that they were being sold out, La Federación Liberal de Trabajadores, the FLT, that they were being sold out by their own leaders in San Juan, they came to uh, Albizu Campos and he said, okay, I'll represent, I'm not taking over your union, but if you, if you think this will work, you realize you're getting the, the baggage of the Nationalist Party, of which I'm the president, but if that's what you want, we'll do it. And they did it. Four months island-wide agricultural strike, it shut down the economy, and amazingly, Wall Street had ne had, hadn't seen anything like it from Puerto Rico. They managed to negotiate very se severely because they shut down the, the economy. The wages doubled from 7.5 cents an hour to 15 cents an hour, uh, which was $1.50 for a 10-hour workday. Um, seven dollars and fifty cents a week and that may not seem like much but this was during the middle of the Great Depression and for the workers in Puerto Rico for many of those families it was the difference between starving and not and so on the island Puerto, uh, Albizu Campos now became this hero this one person that could set like Fidel Castro later on could say you son of a bitch you're not coming down here but on Wall Street, there was a whole different ripple effect because Wall Street is like, it's a bit, to, to me, it's like the uh, wizard, uh, the, the wizard of Oz. There's a lot of smoke and mirrors and, you know, it makes a, you know, it makes a huge sound, but when you really look at it, it can be very vulnerable. I'll give you an example of the vulnerability. Puerto Rico right now owes a $73 billion, supposedly, now, you know, I'll mention a little bit about that. Um, the, the gross national product of the United States is $7 trillion. The municipal bond industry every year is about 
$17 trillion. If you divide 3.6 into 17 trillion, that's about 21%. So at any given year, about 21% of the American economy is cycling through this municipal bond financing mechanism. And if you topple that or play with it or try to recalibrate it in any meaningful way, you're basically touching that just as Social Security is supposedly the third rail of American politics, you know, stick that in your pipe these days, the, um, the, th the municipal bond structure is the third rail of Wall Street financing. And so Albisu was able to do, uh, uh, to, to tell Wall Street, you're not, we're, things are changing down here. Wall Street responding, responded by sending a new governor and a new police chief. The governor was Blanton Winship, a U.S. Army general that had some experience dealing with Native American populations in, in the mainland. And a new police chief was E. Francis Riggs, whose father owned the Riggs National Bank which was the largest bank in Washington, D.C., and which was known, there's an interesting book that, uh, that I read recently called The Fish That Ate the Whale. It's a history of the United Fruit Company, some, some real Damon Runyon type, of, uh, interesting characters and personalities, but at the end of the day, it's about how the United Fruit Company went into a number of Latin America, Guatemala, Honduras, eh, Nicaragua, Colombia, and they staged a, num a sequence of fake revolutions that were actually disguised right-wing takeovers that would install a tin pot dictator that would be, uh, be faithful to United Fruit interests and give them the same kind of concessions that Charles Herbert Allen got for the sugar interests. So the Riggs National Bank was helping to des destabilize uh, to a number of, of, of South and Central American regimes and to undermine legislatures throughout the, su the Southern Hemisphere. And the son of the owner of the Riggs Bank E. Francis Riggs came in as the police chief in, in Puerto Rico. <laughs> First thing that he do, and it was a plan A, very often you'll see this in these regimes, there's a plan A and a plan B. The plan A is to try to bri bribe the local leadership. They did that with Albizu Campos, they offered in a very, very documented fashion $150,000 and a pathway to being the first Puerto Rican governor of the, of the island. And to his credit, Albizu Campos refused that. He walked out and he said, no, I've got a strike. I mean, I'm in the middle, this is where I'm at. But that was plan A, because once Albizu Campos refused that, plan B was to chase and shoot nationalists all over the island. And that and it happened immediately. The meeting, with the, the strike happened in 1935, and they, in that same year, is when, when they shot in Rio Piedras four nationalists in broad daylight, and E. Francis Riggs then convened the press, and he wanted the press, he wanted this message to go out. They asked him, what's going on? Why? Uh, you know, there was no, they, they, those people were unarmed. What's the purpose? And he said, oh, it's really simple. If Albizu Campos continues to agitate the university students and the sugarcane workers, there's gonna be war to the death against all Puerto Ricans. Those are, that's what he enunciated. That's how, he, that's how the United States would roll. Because see, in Puerto Rico, in, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas, but what happens in Puerto Rico never happened at all. It was like Macondo. It was like the, the 100 years of solitude. Well, this is the same situation. Puerto Rico, especially at that time, was separated by 1,500 miles of ocean, a language, 400 years of Ibero-American Ibero history, and technology. Certainly there was, there was no computers, there was no television back then. Radio was basically unilateral. It was be, uh, uh, transmissions were coming into the island. Any information that got off that island, 1,500 miles into the ocean, was controlled by half a dozen AP and UPI wire service reporters who were giving, basically transmitting pre-packaged, regurgitating pre-packaged press releases from the governor's office. And the governor had been appointed by the United States. And we have an army general who's shooting and, and is, uh, so what can you expect? Well, you get the Rio Piedras massacre, and then the following year, in 1937, on Palm Sunday, innocent men, women, and children were peacefully marching, and they even had a permit, down the street in front of a church in Ponce, in support of Albizu Campos, and in support of independence, and these Tommy gun, because they had militarized the police force, Tommy gun the police, it was on the cover of uh, top of Marina and Aurora streets. There's a very famous picture, and it's in my book. And they, had a, they, they created a killing zone of about 20 Tommy gun policemen up top and about 50 police on the, uh, underneath. And they, kept, they started shooting, and they kept shooting for 10, 15 minutes until they, uh, they assassinated 17 men, women, and children. A seven-year-old girl named Georgina Maldolado was shot in the back and, and killed, and two, over 200 people were sent grievously wounded to the hospital, and that's what's known as, as the Ponce Massacre. So we're in a situation now where in this island at that time, 
You have an imposition of a, uh, a new regime, a new way of, of doing business. Samuel Gompers went down and, and, and acknowledged that the wages being paid to Puerto Ricans was less than half what they had been under the Spanish. Their land has been taken away from them. And if you say anything about it, we're willing to shoot you with impunity and, and declare it a war. In addition to that, and this is something that as, as lawyers we, we will appreciate, Two things were, were conducted. The Carpetas program started immediately after Albizu started that strike. That strike was a turning point in Puerto Rican history. And Law 53, when Albizu, when Albizu led that strike in 1935, within one year, they had him in jail. They, he was found, there was a hung jury on the first trial, and somehow they skirted any double jeopardy pr provisions. They it quickly impaneled the second jury. The uh, DA, Cecil Snyder, knew who the jury was going to be before Vordier. He showed the jury members to someone in the, in the, in the governor's mansion, um, to, a, to an artist named Rockwell Kent, who testified that, you know, that jury, I knew who they were two weeks ago. He showed me the list. And that second jury was 10 North Americans and two Puerto Ricans who were working for the government. And that was a jury that sent Albizu Campos to jail. And when he went to jail, he went to jail for the exact same language that Oscar Lopez Rivera for, is in jail right now. Seditious conspiracy against the United States. And as a lawyer, Lynn, you know that you can drive a truck through that language. Right now, if someone wants to, I'm engaging in seditious conspiracy. I should be so lucky to have that honor to, you know, to, to share that, you know, that, that, that as part of my legacy. So Albizu Campos went to jail in 1936 and he died in 1965. That's 29 years later. Out of those 29 years, he was in jail 25. 20, his entire adult life. And the other four years, when he was back on the island, he was surrounded round the clock by a squadron of, of seven days a week, ra literally round the clock, of FBI agents. And anyone who talked or had any contact with Albizu Campos was immediately interrogated and subject to going to, pr to prison. In a, on top of that, when he gets out of jail, for the first stint in December of 47, within three or four months, there was something passed in Puerto Rico, it was called Public Law 53, known as La Ley de la Mordaza, the law of the muzzle, a gag law, which made it a felony punishable by 10 years in jail to, check this out, sing a song, say a word, um, utter a a anything, sing La Borinqueña, the national anthem of Puerto Rico, or own a Puerto Rican flag, in the privacy of, of your own home, let alone not even not even wave it out in public, but own a flag in, in your own home. So, in other words, it was almost like a thought crime. Anything that you that you said or enunciated against the United States or in favor of Puerto Rican uh, Puerto Rican independence, you could go to jail for ten years immediately. They passed that law. They abrogated the First Amendment rights of an entire island of two million people to shut one man up and the Nationalist Party, Pedro, Pedro Albizu Campos. So this is an, you know, an amazing personal history when you look at it. And the more I read it, I had heard pieces of this, but I just couldn't, you know, it just seemed like just too surrealistic. But then as I started reading these, uh, following these requests and seeing how they treated Albizu Campos before and after being arrested, I, I saw that the, with this mounting body of evidence that it was true. Well, sure enough, because of Public Law 53, they're able to land Albizu Campos in jail again. He starts planning now finally a revolution because he realizes that, that um, ironically, George Orwell's 1984 was published in 1948. He inverted the two, the two digits. In 1948, while the United States and the United Kingdom is turning his novel into a bestseller and you know, abhorring the horrors of totalitarianism and a big brother and a government that's into every aspect of your life. In that same year, 1948, was, was the publication date of 1984? It's the same year that they passed Public Law 53 in Puerto Rico. So while the public, the American public understands these horrors, George Orwell was alive and well on the island of Puerto Rico. So Albizu Campos realized that, wow, we are in such a sort of, we have to throw up a Hail Mary pass to let the world know that there's something going down, uh, on down here and we need, it needs to be changed. Well, it's pretty horrific. So they planned this revolution and they were able to essentially pull, uh, pull, pull it off. It started uh, uh, strategically brilliant. They had a, uh, prison br out, a prison break that was led by a serial killer named Cor Correa Coto. Unbelievable, a serial killer led this prison break and there were 110 fugitives out all over the island. So that was phase one of the revolution. It was a prison break from El Oso Blanco prison in Rio Piedras. Then while the cops are out chasing all these fugitives all over this little island, they attack 
attacked the police precincts to get their armories and their guns. That's pretty slick. I mean, you got to give them credit. That was plan two. And they did it with eight towns simultaneously. Then plan three was they couldn't hold off the United States militarily. This was, a, this was basically based on the Easter Rising of 1916, which would be a moral victory. Part three was we will immediately retreat into Utuado, which was a centrally located town in the Cordillera Mountains that could be cut off by two or three roads and they could hold out for about two or three weeks and get word out. There were a few other uh, interesting elements to it. It involved a, an attempt on the, on the life of the governor of Puerto Rico. They assaulted his, uh, the, la, la Fortaleza, and that's the picture that's on the, on, the, on the cover of the book there. And two nationalists, Griselio Torresola and Oscar Collazo, went up to Washington, right. and then just to, you know, just to send a greeting card, just to let them know that we, we sort of mean business, they tried to assassinate the president of the United States, which was actually made a lot of sense. And I, you know, think about it. President Truman had said, well, there's an incident going on between Puerto Ricans, is the way that, that it was being there. We're trying to always discredit, minimize, and marginalize what was happening in Puerto Rico, like it did not exist. If you, that's not Ralph Ellison's invisible man. It was an invisible island, and turning it into a fantasy. Very much not, not part of, of America. So now, when Griselio Torresola and Oscar Collazo tried to, it was actually a suicide mission because, you know, you, know it's not, you can't really credibly think you're going to go and succeed. But what they wanted to do is they wanted to send this message to let the world know that something, something wrong was occurring. The United States, the mainstream media recorded it as fanatics, lunatics, nationalists, terrorists, communists. All these are adjectives for these, for these two men. But what no paper picked up is that these two men were born and raised in the town of Hayuya. And Hayuya, and the people that they grew up with, and all their neighbors, and all their childhood, and everything that they knew, the very day before, 24 hours before they came to Washington, had been bombed by 10 P-47 Thunderbird planes. And after the bombing was completed, with 50 caliber machine guns, they strafed the surrounding uh, the uh, sugarcane fields and the mountains. This is what was done to their hometown 24 hours before. So, you know, on an, on an ordinal scale, if you're, you know, con considering the ethics of this, who's the terrorist? Yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and that, that this narrative is always very consistently inverted in, our, in, in the history of Latin American nations and in the, uh, the history of, of the, basically, of progressive movements. They are always trying to, to put them in a different light, and then so you have this tremendous persuasive burden to meet, and they do it really slickly because the corporate media can, can dominate and create a, an immediate myth an overnight news cycle, and then you're fi just while you're fighting that news cycle, they're screwing you in court. They're doing so. It's you know it's sort of a blitzkrieg. So this story of of, of, uh, of mine is a story of Albizu Campos, um, the amazing highs and lows, and you know the, the violence that people aren't aware of these different massacres, but also a, st a steady psychological drumbeat, because if you think about a hundred thousand secret police files and how they're generated. Often there, you know, there's some there's fabrications in there, but it requires informants too. And how do you get informants? How do you get a hundred thousand police files on an island of two million people? And you do it for six decades. That starts worming its way into the psychology, into the racial memory of those people. So those are three generations. When I was in, in politics, I often found that if you have 10 Puerto Ricans, you have 20 opinions. And it was really difficult sometimes to create that solidarity because there was just sort of this lack of collectivism, of solidarity, of trust. And understandably, because people learn to mistrust and even betray, betray each other. And it's not like there was some inherent deficiency in the Puerto Rican character. It could be done very smoothly. Mira, yo te vengo aquí y te digo, mira, tú, Pedro, ven para acá. Mira, yo oí, me han dicho, they have told me that you said this, this, and, is this true? This is in the police precinct. Come here, sit down. Because you know that there's a law, right? Law 53. You know, I mean, we could send you to jail for 10 years. They'll make shit, they just make it up. They'll, that's how they, start, they started rolling. And of course, you'll defend yourself. Say, no, 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 no. They say, I tell you what, man. Yo, yo conozco tu prima. I know your aunt Rosa. She's a good person. And you know, we know you're good people. So here's what we'll do. OK, look, we're going to give you a break. But you're going to come back next week. And you're going you know, to explain to us, because you know, that's what this guy said. All right. So then it's like a prisoner's dilemma. Then they go to the other guy, and let's say you're, you're named Juan Bobo, because I've taken you as Juan Bobo already. Then they say, mira, do, do you know what Juan Bobo said about you? 
Juan Bobo said that you were seen in this, and you were playing dominoes, and you got drunk, and you said that Albizu Campos was going to do such and such. And so now they, they, can, they can foment. They can start creating a division. They just make it up. And so it's not as if it's something inherent in the Puerto Rican character. It's that you have FBI agents. Yeah. J. Edgar Hoover, his neurosis was let, has free reign in Puerto Rico. You got to give J. Edgar Hoover some bureaucratic credit. That son of a gun lasted for six. He turned his neurosis into an, an inordinate bureaucracy. Yeah. And in Puerto Rico, if you, you got to be careful because if you finish your café con leche, there, there, J. Edgar Hoover could be right there. <laughs> and so. This is part of the experience of, in, of, the, of, the Puerto Rican, of the Puerto Rican left. You have this very graphic violence. The United States, the way that they put down, by the way, this, this revolution in 1950, is that they scrambled these 10 P-47 planes and they bombed the towns of Hayuya and Utuado. They mobilized 5,000 5, National Guard troops. They arrested 3,000 Puerto Ricans in the space of the week. They massacred Puerto Ricans in Utuado with machine guns and they left them there for, for oh, a little over a day where children were walking. It was on a broad street in town to the point where they left them with their insides out. The dogs came by and licked and ate their intestines. It was that sort of graphic, and I'm sorry to convey this, but this is the kind of the, the way that they were willing to operate back in, in 1950. So now you have that plus the, the steady psychological terror. And now let's so now let's go forward, and then I'll, and I'll, I'll I'll leave it. We're in a, at a moment now when Puerto Rico is supposedly owes 73 billion dollars. Consider one law: the Merchant Marine Act of 1920, Section 27, is the is what's known as the Jones Act. Under that law, Puerto Rico is specifically prohibited from developing its own shipping industry. This is an island on its own in the Atlantic. Shipping is a foundational industry. Why can't it have it? Because the Jones Act says that any goods that come into Puerto Rico from any foreign, non-U.S. foreign registry vessel can only come in in one of two ways. If it comes directly in Puerto, into Puerto Rico, it's subject to a steep set of taxes, fines, duty, import duties, fee, uh, fees, the, the result of which is every product in that boat ends up costing 15 to 20 percent more to the Puerto Rican consumer. Everything, if it comes straight to Puerto Rico. There's another option, though. If, you, if that foreign registry vessel wants to come in from, through an, an American boat, it can do it. It has to go to Jacksonville, Florida, and every product, if it's a, a, a motor from Germany, a car from Japan, medicine from Canada, food from South America, oil from Venezuela, and you need oil in Puerto Rico, anything that comes in, in Jacksonville has to be offloaded off the foreign vessel and then reloaded onto a U.S. vessel and then it can come into the Puerto Rico. Wow. Well, that's like a mafia protection racket. Wow. That's all it is. So the result of this is one, it creates 50,000 shipping jobs, stevedore, longshoreman jobs, teamster jobs in Jacksonville, Florida that belong in Puerto Rico. That's, that's one. But the second part and the larger effect is that it allows United States corporations to just underbid that 20, 15 to 20 percent price hike because it's an, it's an artificial trade protection. So for that reason, Puerto Rico is the fourth largest market for U.S. products. Eight, roughly 80 to 85 percent of the products consumed uh, uh, by the Puerto Rican consumer come from the United States. There are more Walmarts and Walgreens per square mile in Puerto Rico than anywhere else on the planet. So Puerto Rico originally was a naval coaling station, then they got it for its agriculture, now it's a dumping ground for U.S. products. And so when you factor in that 15 to 20 percent extra profit that's coming in year after year from the Jones Act for 95 years, from 1920 to this day, it's roughly about six, if you just a simple math, it's about six billion dollars a year of extra profit that is filtering up, it's trickle up economics to these, cor to these corporations. And if you multiply 6 billion times 95, that's, I think, $570 billion. A lot more than Puerto Rico was. That's exactly the point. You could have paid this debt seven times over. But you see, as Harry Truman said, there's lies, damn lies, and then there's statistics. And what they're doing in the case of Puerto Rico is they're reframing this and they conveniently forget certain laws. They conveniently forget that corporations that come into Puerto Rico, such as IRS 936, that allow the pharmaceutical uh, industry to flourish. At one point, 10 years ago, Puerto Rico was producing 25% of the world of the world's pharmaceutical goods, 90% of the pharma that was produced, that was consumed in the United States. One factory in Barceloneta, one factory alone produced all the Viagra consumed in the United States and in Mexico. Just one factory. They, you know, they 
you know, the United, the Puerto Ricans can be very prolific and they can spread a lot of joy if you give them a chance. <laughs> so, um, so, you know, these things that there is a history of these corporate tax abatement deals, but what happened is when the IRS 936 tax abatement expired after 20 years, all those corporations pull up stakes, and since they weren't forced, they weren't obligated to repatriate any of their profits, any now stipulated percentage of profits has to be reinvested into Puerto Rico. They sent it to the Cayman Islands, they sent it to their shareholders. When these companies leave, all they leave is a deep hole of unemployment, worse than what happened before. So because Puerto Rico has ne had its legs taken out from under it and has been replaced by a series of crutches ever since Operation Bootstrap, 936, and all of them give these these cor American corporations a sweet deal, but all they leave is sort of a time, a ticking time bomb for Puerto Rico because everybody gets un un unemployed again. So it is no wonder that the largest employer in Puerto Rico right now is the government. And it's become bizarre. It's, so, it's, it's become so exaggerated. There are 78 mayors in Puerto Rico. If you, 78 mayors, 78 mayoral administrations, and they, they hire their family and things like that. So there's enough blame to go around. The two parties in Puerto Rico, absolutely corrupt. They've been involved in this. They've been financing and kicking this can down the road and basically been hiring their own little family and friends. But at the end of the day, it becomes a class situation. It's not Puerto Ricans versus the United States, the way they try, people try to portray it. It's a class situation with these very well-positioned individuals. These corporations are getting these, be these benefits. These two parties are working with those corporations. And what uh, the American taxpayer is being socked because they're the ones that are paying those taxes that go in and make these transfer payments to Puerto Rico that then filter up because of this corporate, this trickle-up economy, and the Puerto Ricans aren't getting it. They're still as poor as that. The per capita income in Puerto Rico is 16400 per capita, which is less than half that of the poorest state in the Union, Mississippi. So we're, we're in this sort of uh, bizarre situation. It's become very urgent, and then I'm, I'm going to close it out. Next month, Puerto Rico officially becomes insolvent. The, the Government Development Bank, GDP, the GDP, the Fomento, be, runs out of cash reserves in December. The next, the, the month after that, January 2016, Puerto Rico owns a $945 million bond payment to one of these hedge funds, nearly a billion dollars. Those exact hedge funds are the ones that have been lobbying intensively in Washington to make sure that H.R. 870, the Chapter 9 Bankruptcy Extension Act, to create some bankruptcy relief in Puerto Rico. They've made sure that 870 stays bottled up in committee so that Puerto Rico now has no negotiating room left. It is back up against the wall. It has no money in December. It, has, it owes nearly a billion dollars in January, and it can't negotiate. So what they're looking for, what they're, and they started, it started this week. They started to privatize major sectors of the public infrastructure of Puerto Rico. This week, they fast-tracked a bill in the Puerto Rican Senate that has now started to privatize the public education system. It passed this week. This week, they also introduced a five-member financial control board that's going to become the shadow government of Puerto Rico because they're going to oversee all these so-called P3s, public-private partnerships, which are really P5s public-private partnerships for the plunder of Puerto Rico because they are now going to have 35-year leases. They're doing, going to do it to the water supply. The water supply has now RFP. Praza the, has, has, has already enunciated that it's, it's, it's uh, announced that it's open for, for a public-private partnership. PREPA, the, uh, the electrical authority, has, which it, the people of Puerto Rico now are paying about 26, 27 cents per kilowatt hour, which is o close to double what's paid here in the United States. Well, they've also RFP PREPA along with a 4.2 cent price hike, which is roughly about a 20% price hike. So they're already collateralizing, they're saying, look, whoever bids on this, uh, on, on, the, on, the, on the electrical system of Puerto Rico, we're already going to give you, the, the, the buyer of this, a 20% increase that's going to go to the Puerto Ricans. So, and what, guaranteed, that's part of the negotiation, that's part of, that's in the RFP. So this is where we're at, that Puerto Rico now is basically, this was an opportunity, it was a window of opportunity to create some more sovereignty, to maybe reform the Jones Act, to start looking at the relationship, the colonial relationship between Puerto Rico and the United States. But instead of that, there's a sort of a neoliberal formula that is rapidly get, getting, getting geared up to be imposed on Puerto Rico. And people like me, hopefully there's many more, will create some sort of critical mass of opinion and a sense of urgency to stop it or to do, to slow it down, to get the unions, because the unions will be, the, I think, the most, the, the first affected in the, uh, entities, to say, 
hey, listen, we're going to need to slow this down, and we're going to have work stoppages. Nothing is going to happen until we resolve this. So I'm sorry. I know I, I sort of you guys are a captive audience, and I maybe you know overstayed my welcome. But I just want you to leave you with the notion that uh, when I wrote, when I started this book, War Against All Puerto Ricans, it was a history book. Much to my dismay, it is now a primer for what has to happen in Puerto Rico very soon. And so I hope you take this knowledge forward and, you know, incorporate it or tell your friends. But let's make sure that a place like Puerto Rico doesn't become the next doesn't become the next uh, di uh, doesn't become uh, Disneyland doesn't become uh, gentrified to the point that we never that we lose it as, and we lose what we grew up with which was our, which our own personal heritage and what can happen in Puerto Rico can happen anywhere else in the world so thank you for listening <laughs>